to those that are on the phone line and to those that are on YouTube live. We do welcome you to our Bible study on this evening. I'm the Reverend L.S.A. Godfrey Jr., Senior Pastor Teacher of the Historic Spirit Creek Baptist Church. We're walking through the book of Revelation. We're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse number 6 on this evening. First of all, I ask you to pray uh, for my voice. Really struggling today with some allergy and asthma symptoms. Thank you for your prayers on this past Sunday as well. We lift up those in our communities, those in our families, those in our church family as well that are sick, that are shut in. Just want to call a couple of quick names. First of all, to continue to lift up Mother Gracie Blakely for health and healing. Would you also lift up tragic situation happened with uh, our own brother Butler's sister. Uh, thank God uh, his sister and I believe it was one of the grandson, they were able to escape uh, a burning uh, and fiery, uh, fire in their home. And thank God they were able to escape with their lives. However, um, we know material things can be um, replaced. And we thank God for life and thank God that they were not injured. However, um, they lost everything. They lost everything in terms of their material possessions. So I'm going to ask you, if you will, I meant to do it on this past Sunday, but when I was having the breathing and issuing issues, I wasn't able to remember um, to, to ask for a special offering um, for our musician, uh, Brother Butler's, sister. Uh, we're going to do that this coming Sunday. If you will bring a special offering, uh, we're going to take up a love offering to be able to just help out, um, to be able to offset some of the expenses um, that this family incurred uh, during this tragic fire. And again, we are grateful and thankful to God that they were not injured. Um, as well, would you keep our very own Reverend Ronald Williams lifted in covenant prayer? His uh, he had to travel emergently back to Florida to be able to help take care of his daughter who had been ill, um, continue to lift and cover her in prayer for health and healing. And then sadly, but tragically, her fiance was killed in an automobile accident. And so our hearts and prayers go out uh, to that family. So would you lift and cover with Williams for safe down there and safe travels uh, back when it is time for him uh, to return. I want to remind the Dickens we will have our meeting immediately following Bible study on this evening as well. And again, I thank you for your prayers for my health as well. All right, beloved, we're not going to waste any words. We're going to um, say a word of prayer and we're going to get right into our lesson on this evening. Pray with me, please. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Lord, let it prove now to be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are our strength. And Lord, you are indeed our Redeemer. These and all blessings we ask in the mighty and precious and holy name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, we do pray. Let every heart sing together. Amen. <clears throat> all right. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Let's pick up at verse number 6. And it reads this way. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let's explain that. <laughs> Jesus probably, um, in regards to uh, the Ephesians uh, would not be overly uh, discouraged. Remember, this is a letter. The writer is the Apostle John. <laughs> He's writing um, to the churches in Asia as commanded by Jesus, told us seven churches. Seven is a number of completion. Each of these churches represent a particular spirit that a church may have. And so remember, as we begin in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, we're talking about the loveless church, the loveless church, and that was the church at 
Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. Hey, y'all got air it out in here. Got that <laughs> food going in here. Additionally, <coughs> um, <coughs> so that uh, these particular uh, people, this group of body, the church of Ephesus, would not be overly discouraged. He began, uh, remember in verse 5, he uh, rebuked them and told them that they needed to return to their first love. And remember, that first love was really <laughs> a commitment to the Lord, a commitment to the word of God, commitment to prayer, a commitment to loving other Christians as Jesus had already told us that I will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. And they were to return from being lukewarm to being excited about Jesus Christ. And so he told them that they needed to repent. And so here he picks up just like we do in preaching, we may tell you what's wrong with our lives. We may tell you what is sin, but at the end of the day, after pointing out sin, then we point out correction or we point out the right way uh, to be able to get in line with the truth of who God is and the truth of God's word <laughs> as well. And so <clears throat> he looks to build up the Ephesians here and not to just overly uh, discourage them. And so that's what's occurring and that's what's happening. Let me say right now too, if our internet connection does not um, stay connected, for those that are on YouTube Live, then we'll upload the Bible study at a later time. Again, we're in Revelation chapter 2. We're picking up at verse number 6. And again, deacons, don't forget, we'll meet immediately following Bible study by phone conference line. Okay, let me go back. So he, he begins to talk to them, again, to encourage them. And he's talking about the Nicolaitans. They were complimented because Jesus said they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But then, Pastor, who were the Nicolaitans? And what were their deeds or what were their actions? <laughs> the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is also, it is condemned in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 15. And in that passage, it is related that they occurred and had a lot of immorality and idolatry. Um, let me go a little further. The Nicolaitans, a group of people, like all deceivers that came from the body of Christ, they claimed that they were destroying, that they were not destroying Christianity, but they were presenting an improved and a modernized version of Christianity. In other words, they were pretenders. And the word here goes on to say, as Jesus confirms with them, which I also hate. Now, these are powerful words in that they came from our Savior, who is so rich in love. Okay, for those online, if you hear me, just hold on. We're having a problem with the internet connection. For those that are on the phone line, just hold on. We're having a problem with the internet connection.
All right, looks like we're live again on YouTube. We apologize um, for those on the phone line. We're back up on YouTube, having a problem with the internet connection. Again, if we have a problem with the internet connection, for those that are on YouTube, we will upload the Bible study at a later time. All right, again, I'm picking up at Revelation chapter 2 in verse number 6. We're talking about the Nicolaitans. This was a group of people and they were deceivers. And like all deceivers that come into the body of Christ, they were claiming that they were not destroying Christianity, but that they were presenting an improved and modernized version of it. Amen. But anytime you change and twist the word of God, you change the meaning of it. Amen. So, Jesus says here in red, again, which I also hate, which I also hate. He's talking about the Nicolaitans, talking about their deeds. You know what I mean? He hates the people. He hates their deeds. God always loves the person, but it is sin that he hates. He said, which I also hate. Now, these are powerful words and that they came from our Savior, who is so rich in love. We know 1 John 4, 8 tells us, First John 1, um, pray to that God is love. Whoever exactly the Nicolaitans were, whatever exactly they did and taught, we learn something from Jesus' opinion of them. We learn that the God of love, yes, he does. He hates sin. <clears throat> and he wants his people to also hate sin. In other words, God wants us to love what he loves but he wants us to hate what he hates. Let's pick up at Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Let's look at the A clause. That's the beginning of the verse, of verse 7. Now, this is a general encouragement and exhortation, not only to the church at uh, Smyrna, which is a persecuted church. This is where we're picking up. This is the, this is the persecuted church. Remember, we're leaving now the loveless church, but again, we're going to pick up when we get to verse 8 at the persecuted church. So we're still talking about the church at Ephesus, which is a loveless church, all right? So Revelation 2, 7, the A clause says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, let's go after that first part. He who has an ear. Now, this qualifies everyone, or at least everyone who is willing to listen, spiritually speaking. But in order to spiritually hear, you also really need to be able to hear physically the word of God. Why? Because faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. This letter was not only written to the church in Ephesus in the Apostle John's time period and day, but it was written to us individually as Christians as well and to all Christians throughout eternity, throughout the centuries. Remember, anytime God is speaking to the nation of Israel or God is speaking to the church, he's also speaking to us in our individual lives as well. <laughs> John goes here a little bit further. He says, let him hear what the Spirit, capital S, meaning Holy Spirit, says to the church. Notice, as I told you on Sunday, the Holy Spirit can walk, the Holy Spirit can talk, the Holy Spirit can teach. Each one of these seven letters, it applies to all churches. We must hear what the Spirit says to the churches, not just one church. These letters, each of them, were meant to speak to you and to me. If we will only have an ear to hear what the Spirit said, spiritually speaking. Let's go a little bit further. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, look at the B clause, where it picks up now with a promise of a reward, a promise of a reward for those that hear spiritually and obey. 
It says in red, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right, let's deal with to him who overcomes. Jesus made this promise to him who overcomes, but what does this overcomer overcome? Good question. We usually think of overcoming in dramatic terms of overcoming sin and spiritual warfare. But here Jesus seems to speak of overcoming of their coldness of their heart and lack of love marked by they left their first love. Additionally, here in red, I will give to eat from the tree of life. The promise for these overcomers was a return to Eden, perfect place, restoration, and eternal life. <clears throat> this was meant first in the eternal sense of making it to heaven, which again was no small promise to a church threatened with the removal of Jesus' presence. It is also meant in the sense of seeing the effects of the curse being rolled back in our own lives walking in and redeeming, being redeemed by Jesus' love. Let's go a little bit further. So, I will give to eat from the tree of life, meaning eternal life. That's what Jesus has afforded and has given to us by his death, burial, and his resurrection. Notice the place of the blessing is in the midst of the paradise of God, or heaven, or perfect place. Or perfect state. Originally, the word paradise meant a garden of delight. Eventually, it came to mean the place where God lives. The place where God lives. Wherever God is, that's paradise. Amen? Let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 2. Let's look at the A clause of verse 8. This is where we pick up we're transitioning to another church now. Now we're talking about the church at Smyrna. The church at Smyrna. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, the A clause. <coughs> All right. This is referring to, as I told you earlier, the persecuted church. Persecution means to be under pressure. They were under pressure because they were practicing Christianity and they were disciples, they were followers of Christ. It says, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. It's a commandment again for John to write. Smyrna, let's talk about that city for a little bit. This was a large, beautiful, and proud city. It was a center of learning and culture. It was proud of its standing as a city. Smyrna was an outstandingly beautiful city. It, it, was, it was a rich city in terms of material wealth, but it was poor spiritually. And there was a lot of goddesses that were worshipped, goddesses like the Dia Roma and uh, a lot of different idol worship and things like that were happening in this particular place. Let's go a little bit further. Revelation 2 Verse 8, let's look at the B clause, second part. This is where Jesus describes himself to the church at Smyrna. He says, these things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Let's look at the first and the last. <laughs> Jesus chose this title from his initial appearance to John. We find that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. We also find that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, which we read and studied, to speak to Jesus' eternal character. Now, the first and the last are titles, as we talked about before, only belong to the Lord Yahweh. And we find that, as we told you before, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 41 and verse 4, Isaiah 41 and verse, chapter 41, verse 4. We also have Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6. In Isaiah chapter 48 and verse number 12. Let's look at who was dead and came to life. In other words, he was resurrected. Jesus chose this title as a description for himself in his initial appearance to John. We saw that 
and read that back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. He did this to remind the Christians in Smyrna that they serve a risen Lord who was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Death could not hold Jesus, and guess what? It cannot hold his people either, amen? Because one of these days he's coming back for his people. The association with death and the victory of resurrection is throughout this particular letter. The name Smyrna, it comes from the word that we've heard before, myrrh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh was a sweet smelling perfume that was used in embalming dead bodies. Let's go a little further. Let's look at Revelation chapter two, verse nine. It says here, what Jesus knows about the Christians in Smyrna. It's a description of that. He says here, I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but cancels out everything before you are rich. Well, how are we rich? You're rich in spiritual things. As I told you on Sunday, we're wealthy. Why? Because we have eternal life. Because we are in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We have everything that money can't buy and that death can't take away. Death cannot take away eternal life. And money can't buy eternal life. Amen? It has been blood bought by Jesus Christ. He said in verse 9 of Revelation 2, I know the blasphemy of those <coughs> who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Let's look at I know your works. Jesus knew the works of the church in Ephesus. Also in Smyrna, Jesus also knew their works, tribulation, and poverty. He knows these hardships both in the sense that he saw what happened to them and in the sense that he knew their hardships by his own personal experience. Remember, foxes have holes the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no way to lay his head. Jesus was not focused on material possessions. Poverty. According to history, Smyrna was a very prosperous city, yet the Christians there were very poor. The word used for poverty is the word for abject poverty. They weren't just poor, but they were very poor. Let's go down a little bit further. He said, I know the blasphemy. Jesus knew the untruths that were being spoken by these opposers of Christianity. Jesus knew the abuse these Christians endured at the hands of so-called religious people, religious men. He said, those who say they are Jews and are not. So historically we are told <clears throat> there was a large and hostile community of Jews in Smyrna. But this tells us <clears throat> that a true Jew is one who trusts God and believes in Jesus Christ. We find that in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 3. Let me read it to you. Philippians 3 and verse number 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Others may be Jews from a racial standpoint and from ethnic standpoint, which still has its place before God. But they were not Jews, spiritually speaking, before God, one that believes in Jesus Christ as the risen Christ being the son of God. Then he talks about, I know. I know what? In the midst of this kind of affliction, we have to remember it is easy to think that God has forgotten but whatever it is that we go through, no matter how long we've been in it, <clears throat> we have to remember that Jesus knows and he remembers. Let's look at the other part of Revelation 2 and 9. Let's look at what Jesus thinks about the church in Smyrna. He said, but you're rich. Rich. Every outward circumstance said that the Christians in Smyrna were poor, even destitute. But Jesus saw through the circumstances to see that they really were spiritually rich. Let's go down a little bit further. He says, and poverty, but you're rich. The contrast between material poverty and spiritual riches of 
of the Christians in Smyrna reminds us that there is nothing inherently spiritual in being rich. Nevertheless, there is also nothing inherently spiritual in being poor. Amen. It takes money to go through this world. <clears throat> Material riches tells us in the Bible they can be an obstacle to the kingdom of God. They can be an obstacle to going to heaven. Say, Pastor, where do you find that? Well, we find that in a New Testament reference of Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Let me read that for us. Mark chapter 10, verse 23 through 25, talking about the difficulty of being rich and getting into heaven. <coughs> And Jesus looked around about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his word. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Written in red. Verse 25. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle it's an exaggeration. We know a camel can't get through the eye of a needle. Maybe not even the hair of a camel can get through the eye of a needle. But he said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man or woman <coughs> to enter into the kingdom of God. He said, Pastor, what's the problem with being rich? It's not a problem with being rich. It's a matter of the heart. Where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. In other words, if we're dependent upon our money, we won't be dependent upon God. And many times if we have money, we think we're better than everybody else. So we don't even think we're needed in need of salvation. We have to remember nobody's so good that they don't need Christ. And nobody's so bad that Christ cannot forgive them and redeem them. Amen. Let's go a little bit further. Revelation 2 verse 10. This is the point of what Jesus wants the Christians in Smyrna <laughs> to do, what he wanted them to do. He told them in verse number 10, fear not or do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I, Jesus promises himself, will give you the crown of life. <laughs> All right, let's talk about do not fear. Literally, this is better translated, stop being afraid. The Christians in Smyrna suffered under persecution, and they were afraid. Sometimes, beloved, you and I, we think that Christians who endure persecution, a lot of times we look at them and think about them as being almost superhuman in some way. And we sometimes don't appreciate the depths of fear that they may struggle with. There were things which they were about to suffer. And Jesus wanted them ready to stand firm spiritually against those things. All right, let's look at this part of the verse where it says, <coughs> The devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Here, Jesus described the nature of the persecution that would come against the Christians in Smyrna. Apparently, they would be in prison, but it would be for a specific period of time. It's going to be limited by God. It was going to be tribulation for 10 days. It's the same way today. Remember the testimony of our elders, grandmama and them will say, trouble, what? Doesn't last always, right? So there was going to be trouble. There was going to be tribulation and trial, but it was going to be for a limited period of time. Now, some believe that these 10 days represent 10 years. You know, we can go back and forth about that either way. Literally, it does say 10 days. We know God time, counts time differently than we count time. Either way, it was a limited period of time. Let's go a little bit further. According to Jesus, the persecution about to come against the Christians of Smyrna, 
It didn't come from God. It came from the devil. At the same time, it was measured. It was limited by God. And surely the devil wanted to imprison them for a longer time. But God, amen. I love but God. He limited their tribulation to 10 days. All right. What about them being thrown into prison? Being thrown into prison, particularly in this period of time, was severe persecution. In that day, prison was never used for rehabilitation or just holding and keeping people. It was rarely used to punish someone. <coughs> Excuse me. Normally, uh, people were thrown into prison as they awaited trial and execution. All right, let's go down a little further. He said, again, you will have tribulation 10 days. And I told you there's a lot of back and forth in terms of different commentators on what they believe about those 10 days. It's not the real important point. The most important point is that God placed the limits on anything that the devil does or wants to do. Remember Job? The devil had to ask permission to come after Job. Amen? So God has control and power and all authority, even over Satan. <laughs> he says that you may be tested. If this attack came from the devil, then why couldn't these Christians in Smyrna just rebuke Satan and stop the attack? Question mark. Well, because God had a purpose in their suffering. We have to remember he allowed it to happen. Anything that God allows to happen, he lets it happen for a reason. He has a purpose in it. So God uses suffering in one way is to purify us, to purify us. Say, Pastor, I need a word on that because we know we don't like suffering. We don't. It's not in our natural state. But suffering can serve a spiritual purpose. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1. <laughs> verses 6 through 7. First Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, meaning many different trials and tribulations and manifestations that you've gone through. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, persecution, pressure, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, there's going to be reward for suffering for Christ. There's going to be a reward for suffering for the kingdom's sake. Amen? Let's go a little bit further. God is also, for his purpose, interested in testing us, not tempting us. Temptation comes from the devil, right? Remember, even Jesus was tempted, but the scripture says, without sin. So it was the devil that came to tempt Jesus. But he didn't have anything to work with. Why? Because there was no faults in Jesus. There was no immorality in him. There was no sin. Therefore, there was nothing for the devil to try to provoke, to get Jesus to do something that he normally would not have done in his holy and righteous state. So he was uh, fully God and fully man, but again, without sin. One of the ways that we're tested and tempted is that we are tempted many times of our own lust and of our own sin. In other words, the devil studies us he will use something about us, our character, something about our behavior, something about our mind and our thought processes. He will use those things to tempt us. And many times we're tempted through deception. He makes it seem like we're going to get something good from doing something bad, but you will never get anything good from doing something bad. Amen. Remember Jesus in Matthew chapter four, he was hungry. He had been fasting. 40 days, 40 nights. And the devil came to tempt him while he thought Jesus was weak in the flesh. He came to tempt him while he was hungry. And what did he tempt him with? He told him what? 
turn these stones into bread. Amen. So legitimately, Jesus could have done it. But Jesus said, get me, you know, behind me. Satan, go on about your business. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Let's go a little bit further. He says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. This is the promise of the reward. What Jesus said to his church is important, but what he didn't say is also important. Jesus didn't have a single word of rebuke or correction for the Christians in Smyrna. All he had was the promise of a crown and the encouragement to be faithful until death, which is literally means become faithful unto, uh, until death. Stay faithful, even though it kills you. Stay faithful, all right? There are two words of crown in the ancient Greek language. One described the kind of crown a king would wear. It was a crown of royalty. The other kind of crown was called the Stephanos, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-O-S, the Stephanos, which is used here. It is given as a trophy to a winning athlete. Jesus looks at the Christians of Smyrna and says to them, you are my winners. Therefore, you deserve a trophy. Amen. Let's go down a little bit further. Let's look at Revelation chapter 2 and let's look at verse number uh, 11. Verse number 11. Now, this is a general exhortation to all again who will hear. Not just physically speaking, but spiritually speaking. He who has an ear, it says, let him hear what the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit says to the church. He who has an ear. See, though the Spirit has something to say to us through every one of these churches, this letter to the Christians in Smyrna may apply least of all to modern Western Christianity today as well. To this point, we simply don't face the kind of persecution that the Christians face in Smyrna. However, there was a man, Greek by the name of Polycarp, he was a remarkable example of both the persecution and the courage of the early Christians. Let's go down a little bit further. Let's look at the B part, the B part of Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to close there. All right, here's the promise of a reward. Here's the promise of a reward or the reward. <coughs> Excuse me. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Let's explain that. He who overcomes. This was a promise for the overcomers. Remember, Jesus, the word has already told us that we're more than conquerors. The Apostle Paul, the book of Romans. This promise is for those who overcome the threat of persecution and the presence of persecution. We might say that we overcome by our close association and relationship with Jesus, who is the ultimate overcomer. And Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. You find that in John chapter number 16 and verse number 33. John chapter 16 and verse number 33. Last part, shall not be hurt by the second death. <clears throat> Two different types of death, physical death, second death, spiritual death. Those who overcome in Jesus will never be hurt by the second death. The second death represents going to hell, all right? This is spiritual death the lake of fire, all right? We'll read about that further in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 14. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 14. 
and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, referring to a spiritual death. It's also referenced in Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 8. Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Thank God for Jesus Christ. We're saved from the second death. So though Satan threatened and attacked their lives, Jesus promises his overcomers that death has already been conquered for us. That's one of the beautiful things about reading and studying the book of Revelation. We get to the end of the book and we win. Amen? It, it's already set. It's a fixed fight. Why? Wow. Because of what Jesus did at Calvary's cross. A couple of commentary comments on the second death. The second death was a Jewish uh, rabbinic or rabbi expression for the total extinction of the utterly wicked. That's what they believe, second death. And then finally, as we close, all men die. Listen now, all men die, but all are not killed with death. Or it is a woeful thing to be killed with death. All right, beloved, we're going to end right there. Next week, God's willing, we'll pick up in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 12. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 12. Don't forget your giving. If you want to give right now, you can give electronically by cash out, dollar sign, Spirit Creek Baptist, dollar sign, Spirit Creek Baptist. Don't forget to bring your tithes off from sacrificial giving. Don't forget to bring something for a special offering for Brother Butler's sister that was burned out of her home on last week. Amen. We look forward to seeing you live and in-person worship this coming second Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. at the Historic Spirit Creek Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us. Our prayers are with you. Thank you for your prayers for me. Amen. Take care.